Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at compartment syndrome. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment, share the channel to tell a friend to tell a friend that indeed we are covering each and every single topic on the syllabus and grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. So when we talk about compartment syndrome, we're going to be focusing mostly on acute compartment syndrome. There is a chronic variant, but I shall not cover that in this video. We shall be looking mainly at acute compartment syndrome. So remember that this is a syndrome which is going to be characterized by an increase in intracompartmental pressure. And this increase in intracompartmental pressure is happening within a limited space. Therefore, if there is an increase in this intracompartmental pressure in a limited space, this may actually compromise the circulation. It may compromise the function of the tissues that are found within that closed space. Remember that compartment syndrome can affect virtually any compartment in the body or the compartments that largely consist of muscles, but it is very common in compartments of the leg, in compartments of the forearm, in compartments of the thighs, in compartments of the arms. And when you are talking about the lower limbs, you define compartment syndrome as an intracompartmental pressure that is obviously exceeding 30 millimeters of mercury. So in essence, you can think of compartment syndrome as when you have a situation where the tissue pressure in a closed muscle compartment uh, group is actually exceeding the perfusion pressure and therefore this is going to lead to muscle as well as nerve ischemia. Some causes of compartment syndrome include things like increase in fluid content. You could have things like intensive muscle, muscle use that could happen in tetany where you have this sustained muscle contraction, vigorous exercise, even seizures because remember when someone is seizing the muscles are uh, violently jerking so they're violently contracting and relaxing then you could also have this increase in fluid content in, in patients that have burns in patients that have a decreased serum osmolarity which is um, for example in nephrotic syndrome remember that you have uh, two forces that are across a blood vessel. You have what is known as a hydrostatic pressure and what is known as an oncotic pressure. But I will explain all this phenomenon very shortly on a black slide so that it makes a lot of sense. You could also have DVT, deep vein thrombosis. You could have positioning of the patients, especially after trauma, even hematoma that can form, that can lead to in increase in uh, fluid content as well as increase in, intra in intracompartmental pressure. You may also have a trauma. Fractures are actually by far one of the most common causes of compartment syndrome. You may have circumferential burns, which I already alluded to earlier on. You may also have some high pressure injuries, such as gun injuries, even oil-based um, material injuries. You could also even have snake bites that uh, are often due to the snake venom. Then you may also get some iatrogenic causes, meaning that it is the healthcare professions that are causing this. So you, you get someone who's applying a dressing that's too tight, maybe a plastic cast, a POP that's, a, uh, that's applied too uh, soon or too fast. You may also get individuals that are lying on one side, especially in comatose patients. If you do not turn them too hourly, they may lead into compartment syndrome. Then you may also get massive hypertonic IV infusions. You may get extravasation of chemotherapeutic drugs into uh, muscle compartments or closed compartments leading to compartment syndrome. These are just some of the few causes of compartment syndrome. Moving on to the pathophysiology. So here that's where I want to show you a black screen so that I can explain this very, very well. And so that you do not forget this so I shall decide to use blue as a color. So first of all, let's say we have a blood vessel here, okay? Remember that within a compartment, you're going to be having a, a blood vessel that is pretty much draining uh, blood away from this. So we shall call this the venous system. So this is going to be draining blood away. So this is known as the venous system, V. Then you have another, another blood vessel, which I shall draw in red, that is pretty much bringing blood towards this compartment. So you refer to these as arteries. So you have arteries here. So these are going to be bringing blood towards this area. So I shall call this A. And then in the middle here, which I shall use purple, 
you have of course capillary a capillary network over here okay eventually these uh, arteries are supposed to branch into arterioles and then the arterioles are going to branch into capillaries the capillaries are supposed to merge to form venules and the venules are going to merge to eventually form a vein so you have this arrangement that's happening uh, pretty much this is a simplified diagram i know my art is very amazing but this is a very simplified diagram and of course here you have your tissues okay you have your tissue over here so back to what i told you about the two forces that are going to be existing across the blood vessel you have your hydrostatic pressure and you have your oncotic pressure or osmotic pressure so i shall draw a cup here as a sidebar so forget about the drawing that I've just put on your screen here and focus on the cup that I'm drawing on the right of your screen here, which I shall demarcate as this uh, being our sidebar over here. Suppose you have a cup here and you decide to fill this cup with water, which I shall draw as blue. So you decide to fill this cup with water over there and it's blue. So remember that water is going to be consisting of uh, water molecules and these water molecules are in constant motion they are constantly moving they're colliding against each other and they're colliding against the walls of this container so the force that's going to be created or the pressure that's going to be created when these molecules collide against the walls of the container you refer to this as your hydrostatic pressure and remember that this hydrostatic pressure tends to push this fluid out of the cup so it tends to push fluids out of this space in which it is contained. If there is an opening or, or hose within this cup, then the water will be forced through those holes. Then in addition to this, let's say we have some solutes that are added to this cup. Let's say we add some salt. Remember that salt tends to draw water towards it. So this salt may attract or these... Uh, electrolytes or uh, ions sometimes even it could be proteins that may attract water towards themselves so the pressure that's uh, generated or the force that's generated to draw this fluid back into the vascular space is referred to as your osmotic pressure now you have a special type of, of osmotic pressure that's known as aquatic pressure which is offered by proteins pretty much albumin that's why i say it in nephrotic syndrome you may sometimes lose the albumin that may be there so if you lose the albumin it means that this oncotic pressure decreases and if this oncotic pressure decreases you have a lot of hydrostatic pressure pushing this fluid out of the vascular space and not so much that is drawing the fluid into the vascular space so those are the two forces that are across a blood vessel you have the hydrostatic pressure and you have the osmotic pressure and a special type of osmotic pressure that's known as colloidal pressure that is offered by proteins so whatever the case may be let's say this individual here has trauma and they have some sort of injury to the body part they have some sort of injury that is happening to the blood vessel so remember that whenever there is injury that's happening to the blood vessel what is going to be happening is that there's going to be fluid that's going to be leaking out there's also going to be an inflammatory process that's going to happen and remember with inflammation there's going to be be changes that are happening in um, the blood vessels you're going to have changes that are happening within the cells one of the changes that is happening within the blood vessels is that there's going to be increase in capillary permeability of the blood vessels so it means that the endothelial spaces are going to become much larger so it means a lot of proteins are going to be leaking out a lot of cells are going to be leaking out in the interstitium so there's going to be edema i don't know how i wanted to spell edema over there so there's going to be some edema that is happening here so picture this you have some proteins that are accumulating here you have cells that are accumulating here so what is going to happen is that the osmotic pressure within the tissues is going to be high Okay, so the tissue pressure is going to be high. So it means that this is now going to keep drawing more fluid into the space. So more fluid is going to be drawn into the tissue space. Now what happens is that once you draw more fluid and more content actually increases, the pressure within these tissues is actually going to increase now when this pressure in these tissues is going to be increasing, remember that these tissues are also going to be exerting a certain type of pressure on the blood vessels themselves and within the blood vessels. So they'll begin to compress on the blood vessels. The increase in the tissue pressure will lead to compression of blood vessels. But remember that uh, arteries are high resistance vessels and veins are low resistance vessels. So it means that the veins are going to collapse first. So you're going to be having this increase in tissue pressure that's going to be causing increase in um, pressure on and within the venous system. So it means that these veins are going to be blocked so it means that there won't be an outflow of um, 
fluid out of this compartment. But remember that the arterial supply is still intact, which is why in patients with compartment syndrome, if you have a pulse that is present, it may not necessarily rule out the presence of compartment syndrome. So you just having a pulse doesn't mean compartment syndrome cannot be there because in the early phases or in the early stages, you have this venous drainage that's going to be blocked. So you have this venous drainage that is blocked. So what's going to be happening is that most of the fluid is going to be entering through the arterial system, but it won't be able to leave through the venous system. So it means that there's going to be a backup of fluid in this arterial system. So this further increases the hydrostatic pressure in the arterial system. So if this increases the hydrostatic pressure in the arterial system, this is going to be forcing more fluid out of this arterial system. And you can already see the vicious cycle that we have created. So once we now uh, push out more fluid into the uh, tissue space, even the tissue pressure begins to increase even further. With further increase of the tissue space, you have even further blockage of the venous circulation and the cycle continues until you reach a point where this tissue pressure is now going to exceed the pressure that is found in the arterial system, such that now the arterial system is going to be blocked. And then once this arterial system has been blocked, so it means that you're not going to be bringing in blood. So what's going to be happening There's going to be waste material that is going to be accumulating here, carbon dioxide, lactic acid, because there's going to be some anaerobic respiration that's going to be taking place. And this accumulation of these waste materials and the absence of blood flow is obviously going to be leading to the pain that we're going to be seeing in compartment syndrome. And of course, if this is prolonged, there may be some ischemia that happens and tissues may begin to die. And remember, if you have muscles that are present within this compartment, remember that muscles are going to be storing a special type of hemoglobin that is referred to as myoglobin. So this myoglobin can be released into the bloodstream. And once it's released into the bloodstream, it may actually go and cause damage to the kidneys and it may lead to renal failure and eventually death. I really hope you actually understood the pathophysiology of compartment syndrome. I will go over it slowly as we read through the slides. So remember that the first thing is that you have an edema that's usually a sequel of trauma. And if this is going to be occurring in a limited anatomical space, such as the four compartments of the lower limb, the tissue pressure is going to rise. So as you get this rise in the tissue pressure, this is going to lead to pressure on and within the local venous system. So this pressure is going to rise and arterial resistance subsequently is also going to rise and there's going to be a reduction in the inflow. But remember, you have a blockage of the venous system, but you still have some arterial blood that is entering into this compartment. So you get this acute compartment syndrome when you have this tissue pressure that's going to be exceeding the venous pressure and is going to be impairing the blood flow ultimately. So if you do not treat this, you're going to have this vascular uh, compromise and it's going to lead to ischemia of uh, the enclosed muscle. And due to this lack of oxygen and accumulation of waste products, there's going to be pain as well as decreased peripheral sensation, obviously due to nerve irritation. And with this continued increase in intracompartmental pressure, eventually there's going to be a compromise in arterial blood flow. This is going to lead to these late manifestations that we see, such as an absence of a distal pulse, which is why I told you that an absence of a pulse does not necessarily rule out, or the presence of a pulse does not necessarily rule out compartment syndrome. You may have hypostasia, which is a decrease in sensation. Later on, you may actually have absence of sensations. You may also have extremity paresis, which... Um, is obviously um, you may have some paralysis that may be the of the affected limb. Then with this prolonged ischemia, you're going to have necrosis. Eventually, there may be some fibrosis of the muscle, even the surrounding soft tissue structures. And of course, severe cases may lead to renal failure and death. The renal failure is obviously due to the increase in myoglobin, the rhabdomyolysis and increase in myoglobin that's released into the bloodstream. And myoglobin is quite toxic to the kidneys. So the clinical presentation can be remembered by the six Ps of compound syndrome. So you have paresthesia, which is of course the first sign in the leg. And this paresthesia is often seen at the first web space. So the space between the great toe and the second toe. Then you may have pain and the pain of compartment syndrome is characteristic. Number one, it is severe pain. Number two, it is progressive. Number three, it is persistent. Number four, it is poorly localized. And number five, it poorly responds to the conventional treatment to the conventional analgesia. And often this pain is going to be exacerbated by passive stretching of 
the muscle. Like for example, if you have compartment syndrome affecting the lower limb, passive stretching of the toe, for example, can lead to excruciating pain. You may have paralysis, which often occurs when there's ischemia that has been well established. You may get pulselessness, which is shown to occur at late times. So the pulse may be present. Like I already told you, the presence of a pulse does not necessarily rule out compartment syndrome. You may get pallor, which is not necessary for a diagnosis. So some people may actually not consider this as it may not be present. In some cases, you may actually get erythema. Then you may also get poikilothermia, which is a variation in the temperature. Sometimes you may get a tense, tender regional lymph nodes, which is really typical. And um, the pulse will usually be uh, normally felt in the compartment syndrome, but it may become absent if there is any associated arterial injury, a point which I already explained earlier on. So what you really need to note is that after four hours, what's going to be happening is that there's going to be muscle ischemia if this problem is not solved. And this muscle ischemia is going to lead to muscle death. And when the muscle dies, it's going to release the myoglobin that is stored within the muscle into the bloodstream. You refer to this as myoglobinuria then, or myoglobinemia. Then this myoglobin in the bloodstream is going to be filtered out in the kidneys and present in the urine, myoglobinuria. And remember that myoglobin is toxic to the kidneys. So the muscle necrosis, which releases the myoglobin, that's supposed to be excreted in the urine can actually cause damage to the kidneys, leading to renal failure, a, a pre-renal type of um, acute kidney injury. Then, of course, irreversible nerve damage is going to be developing if you have this persistent ischemia that is lasting for eight hours. And remember that the compartment pressure of more than 30 millimeters of mercury is often an indication for fasciotomy. We'll talk about fasciotomy very soon. So there are three methods that you can use in making a diagnosis of in a compartment, uh, intracompartmental pressure. Aside other investigations that you may decide to do, such as a full blood count to rule out any anemia that may actually exacerbate a patient or tip a patient into compartment syndrome, you want to really address that. Then you may also want to do your uh, acute inflammatory markers to rule out an inflammatory conditions such as your C-reactive proteins, your ESR, you may want to do your serum, urea, electrolytes, and creatinine to actually check for the functioning of the kidneys so that this patient, to ensure that this patient is not actually getting into renal failure. So there are three methods that we can use to measure the compartmental pressure. So we may use the white sides, um, or white sides a saline needle technique. You may use an arterial pressure transducer. You may also use a striker device. Now, the white side saline technique is the one that I want you to know because that's the one that the, you may be asked on your exams. So I shall go in a lot of details about it. So there's a traditional setup and there's actually a modified setup. So I'll discuss um, pretty much the modified setup. So you get an 18G needle that's obviously going to be connected to a three-stop way cock. And this three-stop way cock is going to be uh, connected to a 20 mil syringe. One of it is going to be connected to an air filled. So this is an air filled 20 mil syringe. The other one is going to be connected to a mercury manometer. Then the other one is actually going to be connected to um, the um, compartment. So what's going to be happening is that the air filled tubing is going to be connected to the mercury manometer, and then you also get a small amount of saline at um, the site where the tubing is actually connected to the needle. So in this uh, area here, you have uh, this saline, which is present here. So you have this meniscus that they have actually labeled here. You have a little bit of some saline that's present inside here. And most of this here on the other side will be air and then connected to a mercury manometer. So you're going to be compressing and applying pressure on the syringe. And then you apply pressure on the syringe until this meniscus actually flows into the compartment, until this saline actually flows into the compartment. And then the pressure at which this saline flows into the compartment, you check, you check that on your mercury manometer. And that's, of course, would be the intracompartmental pressure. And that's how you're going to be measuring the intracompartmental pressure. I hope that really makes sense. So you'll be applying pressure here in the center. Of course, this pressure will be forcing this um, uh, meniscus of um, saline into the compartment when it reaches the pressure at the compartment. Because remember that it's going to be flowing down a pressure gradient. So from a region of high partial from a region of high pressure to a region of low pressure. I really hope that makes sense. Then you can also have an arterial pressure transducer. So this is going to be a device that's often used in ICU. We can actually use it to measure arterial blood pressure, even the central venous pressure. And there is no need to actually inject any fluid. That's an advantage of you using an arterial pressure transducer. And 
the pressure in the saline tube actually equalizes with the compartment. So you just use a transducer and it's very easy to use. So the transducer can actually be connected to a wick or a slit catheter. Then the slit catheter may have these longitudinal slits to equalize the pressure in the tube with that of the compartment. So just have a look at this, Google this and actually see how it looks like and how it is used. Then you should familiarize yourself. Then you could also use a striker device, which is a variation of the arterial pressure transducer. It's just a different device that can be used to measure uh, the compartmental pressure. Then when it comes to the management of the condition, the treatment of choice is obviously decompression. There is an increase in pressure, so you want to relieve the pressure. So you have to perform an emergency decompressive fasciotomy. Now, following the fasciotomy, you want to address the underlying cause. So you, if there is a fracture, you want to reduce the fracture. You want to stabilize the fracture. If there is vascular injury, you want to repair the vascular injury. Now, if the, compartmental, uh, if the compartment syndrome is actually developing or hasn't yet developed, you may actually decide to place the affected limb at the level of the heart. Remember that elevation in compartment syndrome is contraindicated. Why? It's because you're going to be decreasing the arterial flow and you're going to be narrowing the pressure between the arterial side and the venous side such that now the arterial venous pressure gradient becomes very narrow and this actually worsens the thing. It's aside what we normally do with edema, we elevate the limbs and then the edema fades away dependent on the cause as well. It's not all types of edema that is equal to elevation. Please note this, but in compartment syndrome, we want to avoid elevating, especially if it hasn't yet set in and it's developing. We want to keep the body part at the level of the heart. Then, of course, if there's a tight uh, band-aid or there's a tight cast, you may actually uh, open the cast. You may remove the cast and place another um, much um, modified cast, or you may actually cut through the cast and open it at a specific points, so, uh, those of which we shall look at when we look at the orthopedic topics. And then there's a reason also why when you get acute injuries or fractures, we usually don't apply a complete um, cast and we usually apply a back slab, which is a half cast, because we want to allow for the room for any swelling that may occur, especially within the first week of the fracture, because that's when we expect the inflammation to happen. Then if there is, of course, any anemia, let's say we want to correct any anemia because it may tip the patient into developing compartment syndrome if they are developing compartment syndrome. So you want to transfuse uh, fresh blood. You also want to give some antihypertensives if they have relative uh, hypertension. Then when you're performing a fasciotomy, remember that this is going to be done under general anesthesia. And this is often done when the, and the, when the pressure in the compartment is going to be exceeding 30 millimeters of mercury. So ensure that when you're doing this fasciotomy, you have an adequate length of the incision with, into the skin. You're going to be cutting into the fat. You're going to be cutting into the deep fascia. And you should do this until the underlying muscle actually bulges out very properly and the pressure has been relieved. And you can actually leave the wounds open to allow the swelling to occur unrestricted. And of course, uh, just dress them appropriately with uh, some sterile dressing. And later on, when the edema or the acute episode has actually resolved, you can actually decide to take the patient back to theater where you can actually put a skin graft on it, or you may actually close it directly. Then because these patients are at risk of developing renal failure, you also want to give some renal protection to these patients. So you want to correct any hypovolemia that is present with any crystalloid solutions. You want to catheterize the patient and make sure you're monitoring your urine input-output charts. So you're going to be infusing a 500 mils per hour of crystalloid solution and about 22.2 milli equivalents of bicarbonate, which often we do not use because we cannot really have those facilities to monitor the electrolytes, to monitor your um, urea and your creatinine. So generally you want about 12 liters per day and you want to force diuresis to about eight liters per day because you want to flush the kidneys. So if the diuresis that you have is less than 300 mils per hour, you can administer manitol at a dose of one gram per kg. If the blood pH is greater than 7.45, you can give 250 milligrams of acetazolamide, so meaning that you should actually check for your arterial blood gases. Then of course, monitor your vital signs uh, monitor the urine pH level, even the volume hourly. You want to assess the osmolarity and the electrolytes as well as the arterial blood gases every six hours. Additional management includes antibiotics that you can give broad spectrum in patients that actually have burn wounds, in patients that have uh, fractures, especially open fractures, even crush wound injuries. You may also want to cover them on antibiotics. Hyperbaric oxygen therapy has actually been seen to actually... Um, 
have a positive effect on compartment syndrome. And the best results were actually obtained when this therapy was actually started early. So what we can do is actually offer this treatment twice daily. So you're going to be putting this uh, person in the hyperbaric chamber at two atmosphere uh, absolute. And you can go up to 2.5 and you do this for about 90 to 120 minutes and this is recommended for about five to seven days and as you're doing this frequently examine the affected part and of course um, manage this patient and manage the symptoms that may arise thank you for spending your time to listen to this review lecture video on compartment syndrome if you did like the video drop a like and let's smash the like button as much as possible to help me out with the algorithm share the page and share this video to someone who you think may benefit from these videos subscribe if you haven't hit the bell notification icon to be receiving such notifications of these videos every time i post to zambia and beyond my name is dr moses kazevu until next time